Alright folks, channel your inner classroom teacher and follow Angela's example. We're going to close the gap and add another row of chairs because this is the problem we all want to have. We're oversubscribed for a very interesting talk. We never want to turn anyone away from our living room. It's not the room you want to have if you're teaching in the middle of the yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Your new colleagues will forgive you. <laughs> so we'll the presenter. If anyone needs to get up in the middle and walk out, I won't take it virtually. <laughs> Come on in, Michael. Grab a row seat for it. Oh, are you headed there? No, no, no. Here. Here. Go ahead. Okay. International. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon. I'm Janet Carlson. I'm the faculty director to the, for the Center to Support Excellence, Teach, Excellence in Teaching, which is where you are. I do not have excellence in speaking. So <laughs> um, Pondering Excellence is a speaker series we launched four or five years ago with the emphasis on pondering. The idea that Getting to teaching excellence is a challenging pursuit. And in order to get there, we need to ponder, we need to expose ourselves to new ideas, um, we need to engage in professional dialogue. And so CSEC has tried to create that space monthly during the school year. And to that end, we have a speaker who I think brings out the ponder in all of us. Mm -hmm. And I'll get to a bit of an introduction on her in a moment. I'm gonna have you identify Sort of your place in teaching excellence. How many of you work in pre service education? Great. Good to see you all. And I actually know enough faces to know we represent multiple programs and different groups. So that's really cool. Um, how many of you are practicing teachers? How many of you are practicing teachers in the K 12 classroom? All right. Very good. Welcome. How did you manage to get here at this point? Did I manage to get here? Oh, I have. Who knows to that pause? Often we, we scheduled this at um, closer to 4 3 in the afternoon, but Sarah's flights didn't quite allow that today, so we really appreciate your recognition for being here. How many of you are educational researchers? And I realize you can wear multiple hats when you have to use it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, we have a nice mixed crowd, which just helps our ponder. So I don't want to use up any more of Sarah's time, so let me do a little bit of the background. I met Sarah in the context of the Code of Practice Consortium, which is a group of um, universities across the country that are looking at teacher education, both pre-service and in-service, and asking, what can we learn about the improvement of practice that results in better student learning and better student learning for all? And I was Respond. You're still that person, and I was so impressed with Sarah. I knew some of the directions that CSET was going. We began a conversation about her doing a postdoctoral uh, post doctoral fellowship at CSET, and so she was here. Um, and it seems terrifying with that much time. Yeah, <laughs> it does just feel like you were here. Yeah. Of course, we bring her back a lot, which helps. Um, and she really engaged in thoughtful consideration of bringing the practice-based approach into a pretty extensive program that we have with um, in-service teachers. So her work today will be in that, her talk today will be in that general space with this emphasis on looking at social justice educators. Um, I'm assuming in part because of an article critiquing practice-based approaches and not being in this space um, that some of us take issue with. But um, I, don't, I don't know exactly where your talk is going, but the title told me that, made me guess that much. Sarah is currently at the University of Pennsylvania as um, a research assistant professor. She is an amazing thinker in the space of teacher ed for both pre-service, in-service, and she's done work, we'll see if that's not enough, she's done work 
looking at the challenges for LGBT kids in school and what makes it a safe learning space for them. What did I miss? Chairs. Oh, more chairs. This Somebody is the problem that. I am not in charge of the chair department. So, all right. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah and we will. Thank you so much, Dan. I'm Sarah. It's really good to be here. Um, those of you who are coming in, do not just, you know, budge in the ways you need to. I'll be fine. Make as much noise as you need to. Ask people to move over. We'll want to get everybody into the room. Um, so, I'm Sarah Cavanaugh. And I right now am a research assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I've titled this talk Justice in Practice and Practice-Based Teacher Education for Parasocial Justice Educators um, because this is a question in the field right now. There's a lot of scholarly debate going on about this question. Um, some people are saying that practice and justice are on opposite sides of the spectrum. Other people are making a different argument. Um, to give you the punchline, which maybe I shouldn't ask this question as the title of the talk, the answer I'm going to give is yes. Anyone who knows any of my work would tell you that that is true. So in some ways it's a false question, but I want to get us there by talking about some research that I've been doing recently. Um, and I'm going to start by, um, maybe I'm going to start. Maybe I'm not going to start by doing that. Let's see. Um, oh, great. So I'm going to start by talking about a central conundrum uh, in teacher education. Uh, I'll talk about one study that I designed to investigate that conundrum, and then I'll talk for a long time. Actually, I'm going to give you a kind of broad description of the study itself, because I think the design of the study uh, is in some ways necessary to understand for you to understand the findings. So I apologize in advance for sort of a lengthy description of methodology. Um, and then we're going to talk about the findings from that study and hopefully then be able to have a discussion. Um, so to start with, this is the central conundrum in teacher education. Um, that I'm going to talk about is what I call mismatch. Um, in research on teacher education, there have been a lot of different ways in which we have identified mismatches that get in the way of novice teachers' ability to learn to engage in really meaningful practice in K-12 schools. So one of those is something a lot of people are going to be uh, familiar with. It's the apprenticeship of observation, the idea that teachers were once students, and they spent a lot of time in classrooms as kids experiencing teaching and developed perspectives on teaching that were generally not the same as the kinds of perspectives on teaching and learning that get talked about in teacher education classrooms. So basically the idea behind that is kids, uh, teachers, pre-service teachers spent a lot of time sitting inside of lectures. Then they get to teacher education classrooms and they're told that teaching and learning isn't about lecture, it's about you know, constructive sense making. And that makes there a real mismatch between the past, their past, mm -hmm. and the present. Another really important mismatch in research on teacher education is what Feynman, Nemser, and Buchmann in the 80s called the two worlds pitfall. So this is a mismatch between what novice teachers see in their field placements, in their student teaching, and what they get taught, what gets talked about in, in edu education coursework. So this is a mismatch between the university and the field. So there's a mismatch between people's past and their present. There's a mismatch between the university and the field. And then the third mismatch is what Mary Kennedy in the 90s called the um, problem of enactment. So this is the fact that while people often believe and want to engage in sort of student-centered uh, constructivist approaches to teaching and learning, there's a big difference between believing that and knowing it and being able to do it. So this is a mismatch between knowing and doing. And those, these three things don't often get talked about together. Um, they each have their own bodies of literature. They each were introduced into the literature in different decades. We have a 70s problem, an 80s problem, a 90s problem. But together, I think they, they make up what I'm going to continue throughout the course of this talk to call the mismatch problem. Um, and the way I'm going to define the mismatch problem is that there are difficulties involved in teaching people to enact a practice or practices that rarely occurs in that learner's environment. So it's hard to get people to do something that they don't see. <laughs> and the reason for that is, you don't have examples of it to emulate, either from your past or from the field. Um, and the practice is difficult to attempt because the environment isn't conducive to it. So even if you did have an opportunity to see it, if you were going to go attempt it, it would be really difficult to do. Um, I'm going to do a brief thought experiment. I'm going to take us away from teacher education for a second just to really clarify this point. I want you to imagine that you're a French teacher. You're a French teacher, and your job is to teach high school students French. And none of your students speak French in their daily lives to their parents or to uh, their friends. 
They, they, maybe some of them speak some Spanish, maybe some of them speak English, but in their daily lives, they don't speak French to anybody. But your job as a French teacher is to get them to be able to speak French. So you're facing a mismatch problem, right? The, the learners have few examples of the practice to emulate, and the practice is difficult to attempt because the environment isn't conducive to it. So if you were to say to your students, go out and speak French in your free time, practice the thing we're learning, they would go out, they would speak in French, and everybody would speak back to them in English. So they actually, even if you were to get them to a place of being able to practice, their environment pushes back on them. <clears throat> what that means for you as a French teacher is you have to create, your coursework has to be the place that you create an immersion experience where you are practicing speaking French inside of the context of your class. Um, I was gonna say something and then it totally, this is what happens when you do a five hour workshop and then have a 15 minute break and give a talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I would argue that teacher education has the exact same problem, right? Um, the kind of teaching that we promote in social justice oriented teacher education programs is like a foreign language. If we say to people, go out and teach in, in the naturally occurring environment, teach this thing that we just talked about, not only if you haven't given them examples of it, will they not be able to try it because they don't know what it looks like, but also it's like speaking French to an English speaker. There are, we've all seen ways where you attempt something in a classroom. Let's say you're going in to teach an eighth grade class and you want to teach really student-centered discourse, but kids after eight years in school have lots of experience of being shut down when they try to speak. Getting them to believe you that you really want to hear what they have to say is hard work. The environment isn't conducive to it and it requires a lot of, um, a lot of setup to make happen. Um, so because of this, because the kind of teaching that we promote in teacher education programs, specifically social justice oriented teacher education programs, because it's like a foreign language, how we teach it matters just as much as what we teach. So in the French classroom, you can have the amazing scope and sequence. You can work on verb tenses in the right order. You can have all of the right things to learn spaced out in the right way. But if you don't create opportunities to practice speaking French inside of your class, I can promise you that these kids are never going to speak French. I know that because I took six years of French and I forget literally everything about the language from sixth grade to twelfth grade cannot speak the language. Took six weeks of Spanish in Guatemala in an immersion experience, could speak it much better. But the way that we teach something matters to whether or not it, be, it gets enacted. And this matters in teacher education, I think, quite a bit. Um, so what this has meant for my research as a whole, um, just as an educational researcher, the central question of all of my research is this. What can teacher educators do to meaningfully influence novice teachers' practice at particularly complex but pivotally important aspects of teaching that remain stubbornly absent. And I just wanna draw everybody's attention to this idea of pivotally important but stubbornly absent. There are a lot of those things. <laughs> In my work, I tend to focus on two. One of them is facilitating student talk. Um, we know from lots of research that it's really pivotally important for learning. Most of the stuff that I pay attention to is literacy. We've gone on into a whole talk about what we know from research about the importance of discourse um, for student learning. We also know from lots of research that it's stubbornly absent, right? But there was one study from the 90s that Nystra and then colleagues did uh, that found, they had a very high bar for what counted as discussion, but what they found was that among this ninth grade group of students, approximately nine seconds of their day was spent in discussion. So we, we know from lots of research that it's stubbornly important, we also know it's not happening in schools. So how do you, going back to this mismatch problem, how do you prepare people to do something that they didn't experience as students, that they aren't seeing in the field, and that's actually really hard, and even when you believe it's a good idea, and that thing it is very complex. The other thing that I focus on in my research that's pivotally important but stubbornly absent is the work of center and social justice in teaching. So I'm a teacher educator who's taught a lot of foundations courses, um, the, the courses in teacher education programs that tend to focus on justice and equity issues, on identity, um, and the reason I even got into graduate school, the reason I went to graduate school in the first place was I was really, uh, I was a, a queer educator who had taken a bunch of courses in college on being queer supportive on, on the queer theory. But I got into my classroom and I said, the reason I want to be a teacher is I want to make classrooms better places than I had as a student. I want to make sure that I support my queer students and the kids with queer families. And I got into my classroom and I didn't know how to do it. I had every right belief, I had every right conviction. And the work of actually doing it was so hard and I had no support. And I thought, well, I'll go to graduate school to solve that problem. Everybody knows you go to graduate school to learn something like that. 
So <laughs> basically, it's meant that I have spent now a lot of years trying to figure out this question of how do you help people do something when they're convinced it's the right thing to do, but they can't do it. It's really hard to do. And for me, work on practice-based teacher education has given me tools for trying to solve that problem or trying to think about that problem. So centering social justice generally, we know also from just the same way as facilitating student talk, pivotally <clears throat> important for learning. Lots of research has indicated that to us. Um, and also very stubbornly absent, right? So there's surveys that are where we have seen kids take where they're continually saying that they feel um, bullied for various kinds of identity characteristics or uh, curriculum is, is, is still completely whitewashed. There's just endless things we could talk about the ways in which social justice and all the ways that we know from research is a good idea isn't actually present in the K-12 schooling system. So I would argue that these two things um, meet our mismatch problem test. And for me, my research has been trying to figure out, okay, when you have a mismatch problem, what can you do with teachers that helps them be able to enact something productive? So we're gonna take a deep dive into one recent study that I did with a colleague, Katie Danielson, um, who is also one of the teacher educators in the study. So the research questions that um, we had going into this study were these three. One, to what extent and in what ways did the teacher educators that we were studying prepare novices to facilitate the student talk and to center social justice? Uh, to what extent and what ways did the novice teachers that those teacher educators were working with facilitate student talk and center social justice with the kids in their classrooms, from video of their classrooms? And then how, if at all, did the teacher educators instruction influence the novice teacher practice? These are very simple questions, but in research on teacher education, they're actually pretty uh, complex to answer, but also rarely asked. It's very hard, it's difficult in teacher ed to find research that connects not just what was taught in teacher education to whether or not people went on and did it, but how it was taught. So I wanna point out, we're not just saying was this taught, we're trying to figure out how did the teacher educators work on these things with novices and did how they worked on them influence the way in which they got taken up by teachers. Um, so the context of this study, we followed um, 14 novice teachers across their university coursework and their um, then teaching of uh, K-5 students. The university coursework was an elementary teacher education program at a research university. It was an accelerated program, so the teachers were teaching on an emergency credential while they were enrolled in a university program. Um, they were teachers of record at the time while they were learning to teach. Um, it was an integrated co-taught course. So there were three teacher educators um, who in traditional programs all taught their own standalone courses, a math methods instructor, a literacy instructor, and an instructor from a foundations coursework who taught the sort of multicultural education coursework strand. In this program, they all co-taught a course together for elementary teachers. There was more time in that course. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't like it was condensed, there was more time than there would have been in the standalones, but they taught it in an integrated way. It was also a practice-based program that had done a lot of work around being quote-unquote practice-based. The K-6 teaching of these um, teachers was simultaneous to their coursework. Uh, some of them were, they were teaching in really different areas. Some were really urban areas, some were really rural areas. Um, none were majority white classrooms, but the, the, they, were, they varied quite a bit in relationship to the kinds of students in the communities that they were serving. Um, all of the teaching was in poverty impacted communities though, although they were very different poverty impacted communities. The data sources that we had, um, we had the teacher education video, so the video of the novice teachers being taught about teaching. Um, we also had the course materials from teacher education, the interviews um, with teacher educators. So that's from the teacher education side. From the teaching side, we had novice teacher videos. So we had two, two videos per novice teacher. Um, we had the lesson plans, and we also had the novice teachers' reflection on their video. So they watched their video, and then they wrote a reflection about their instructional decision-making during that time. Um, and then we went through a, a set of phases in data analysis. Um, we first did some code refinement with the video, and I can talk a lot about methodology if you want to, but we can, we're going to skip over some of the details of it, but I'm going to get deep into coding with you. Most of what I'm going to talk about with you today is two pieces of data. The relationship between the novice teacher reflection, so how the novice teachers wrote about their decision making inside of their reflection. So this is, they're talking a lot about specific moments in their video and what they were thinking about at that moment in these reflections they were writing. So I'm gonna talk about that and I'm gonna talk about the video from teacher education. We're gonna try to see a relationship between those two things. 
So going back to this slide that we talked about a little bit, I'm gonna now talk to you about the codes that we used on those two pieces of data. Um, the big, one big bucket of codes was, for, was a set of facilitating student talk codes, and one big, big bucket of codes was centering social justice codes. And we used the same codes on the video of teacher education as we did on the novice teacher data. So an example of some of the codes for facilitating student talk were these. Eliciting and responding to students was part of facilitating student talk is how teacher educators taught people to do that and then how the teachers went on and did that. Orienting students to each other, orienting students to text. Those are three sample codes under that big bucket. So something like this, I think students would have gone deeper if I'd asked better questions, was an eliciting and responding to code. In that moment, I should have had the students turn and talk to one another, would have been code with orienting students to one another. Uh, oriented students to text, I think I should have explicitly asked them to include evidence from the text. So all of these codes were developed out of research on um, facilitating student discourse generally, and these were parts of that practice that we pieced apart into codes. The Centering Social Justice codes that we used, um, it was hard to, to settle in on exactly where you start because there are obviously a lot of frameworks out there about social justice. Um, any one of these would have given us a lot of uh, fodder um, and a lot of ideas to work with. What uh, we ended up doing is um, Connie North did a study uh, where she looked across frameworks describing social justice and identified a set of tensions across many frameworks. So we thought that was a good place to start to use her ideas because she was already drawing from all of these other places. Um, and the tensions that she identified were um, many. So one tension was a, basically she's describing across different frameworks that talk about social justice teaching. What are people wrestling with? What counts as social justice teaching across these many frameworks? Um, she noticed one tension between recognition and redistribution. So this was the idea that social justice frameworks sometimes frame the work of justice as redistributing inequitably distributed resources. And sometimes it, it, instead the work of justice gets framed as recognizing groups that have historically been marginalized or unrecognized or invisibilized. And oftentimes these things are intention. And we decided we're, gonna, we're just gonna code both. So anytime something gets talked about as a redistribution of historically inequitably distributed resources, whether the teacher is doing that with kids or whether the teacher educator is doing something connected to that, we're gonna code it with redistribution. The same with recognition. Another tension she identifies is a tension across frameworks relating to social justice between sameness and difference. So all conceptualizations of justice require that we have a belief that all humans are, are same at the level that they have a right to pursue a life that is sort of happy and fulfilling. They have a right to freedom, a right to um, ability to pursue all of that stuff from all of our various constitutional whatnots in France and here, whatever. But at the same time, Every development, every sort of uh, further enhancement of that idea requires that we wrestle with the idea that people are in fact fundamentally different and our ability to be free and our ability to be able to pursue happiness requires of each of us different things. We have different experiences, we have different histories. Um, groups have been denied things for so many years that uh, to be able to give a one group a right to pursue happiness might mean giving that group more things. So all of this is complex. So we said anytime somebody talked about sameness of humans in terms of rights, we were going to code it with a sameness code. Anytime somebody talked about differences across social groups that were related to histories of oppression and marginalization, we were going to code that with a difference code. Another, another tension across here is the tension between macro processes of oppression and micro processes of oppression. So these are the various ways in which oppression operates in community. It operates through interpersonal ways, microaggressions, biases, et cetera, and large structural ways. So we use these codes, in, I'm not gonna get too deep into them, but basically anytime somebody said, talk about affording respect or dignity to members of historically marginalized groups, it got a recognition code. So something like this. I realized that I hadn't read any books to my kids that had characters who wore a headscarf, so I picked the book, ended up getting coded with a recognition code. Right, because this is an acknowledgement that somebody has not been afforded dignity because of their social group status, and I'm going to afford them dignity. A redistribution codes got applied to any talk about the importance of equitably distributing resources, particularly as it related to historically marginalized groups. So um, this, this statement, the kids wanted to talk about how unfair it was that the workers in the story weren't being paid enough, 
and that's why their kids had to leave school and lose out on opportunity, got coded with a redistribution code. So any of these kinds of moments ended up getting some of these codes. I'm not going to go into all of them, otherwise it'll take the whole time. It's not the interesting part. So the first finder, after doing all that coding of the novice teacher reflection in the teacher educator video, was that novice teachers much more frequently reflected on how they facilitated student talk than they did on how they centered social justice. So as they were looking at their videos and thinking about their instructional decision making, five times more frequently, they talked about, they, they applied the, the student talk codes, which was interesting to us because remember, we had a lot of data about teacher education and we knew from all of these course materials, from the interviews um, and from watching the video that the work of centering social justice was in fact really present in this coursework. So it was interesting that five times more frequently in reflections on teaching, the novice teachers were getting these codes related to student talk um, that was applied. So we had a hypothesis. A hypothesis was that it might have to do with how the teacher educators <coughs> were teaching each of those two aspects of teaching, facilitating student talk and centering social justice, not whether they were teaching it. So we wondered, well, even though it's really present, both things are present in the teacher education, maybe they're being taught in different ways. And that is influencing the way and what novice teachers end up taking up. So we set up a new set of codes to apply to that same data. Um, these are pedagogy of the teacher educator codes. So these codes only got applied to the teacher education video, not the novice video. Um, and we use these two buckets. And this is, these are concepts that come from Grossman McDonald, who wrote a piece in 2008 that identified two different kinds of pedagogical activity of teacher educators. One were pedagogies of enactment, and one were pedagogies of investigation. So pedagogies of enactment, they articulated, were pedagogical practices of teacher educators, who teach teachers, that were designed to support novices to enact, to embody, to attempt teaching. Whereas pedagogies of investigation were practices of teacher educators that were designed to support novices to critique, to analyze, to investigate teaching. So an example of some of this is an active body attempt, analysis of videos of teaching, modeling teaching, rehearsals of teaching, um, student work analysis to work on how do you give feedback, lesson plan analysis to figure out how do you plan, right? These are enacting, embodying, attempting. You attempt to lesson plan. You attempt to engage in instruction. You attempt to engage in student work. Whereas pedagogies of investigation were things like discussing scholarly articles, um, listening to lectures or guest speakers talk about teaching and, and learning, uh, student presentations about various interests, miscellaneous instructional activities where people aren't focusing on how do I attempt to enact a practice related to teaching. Um, another thing just to say about this, a lot of our codes for this ended up also using Grossman's representation and speak compositions approximations framework. I can talk more about that later, just if you're interested in the nitty gritty of the code. So the first thing we found after we applied those codes um, was that when teacher educators were using pedagogies of investigation, so that's these, right? This is the scholarly articles. It's less focused on enacting, embodying teaching. When they were using pedagogies of investigation, they actually talked about centering social justice more than facilitating student talk. So while discussing scholarly articles, while uh, having student presentations or guest lectures, centering student, student just, social justice was there more frequently. Not a lot more, it was almost 50-50, but more, which is interesting because this first finding was that actually the novices were talking about uh, uh, facilitating student talk five times more frequently once it hit the classroom. The next thing we found though was really interesting to me. When teacher educators were using pedagogies of enactment, modeling teaching, facilitating rehearsals, screening video of teaching, they talked about facilitating student talk 31.7 times more frequently than they did uh, talk about centering social justice. So when people were looking at the nitty gritty of facilitating instruction, most of what they were talking, we were applying were the facilitating student talk codes. And that was fascinating. Um, so I'm gonna show you an example. This is an example of, um, it's a, I don't want you to take it as an example of pedagogies of enactment generally, <laughs> but it's a very small little segment of something that got coded with a pedagogies of enactment code, just so you can have a little snippet of what that looks like. It's a, a transcript of a teacher educator working with novice teachers 
It takes place directly after that teacher educator has modeled um, a text-based discussion. So she's modeled this and now she's opened it up for a discussion among the novice teachers about what she just did to help them develop a vision of that and to get smarter about it together. So she says, what did you notice about my teaching in relation to eliciting and responding to students? What is something you noticed? One novice says, you asked probing questions. She says, well, I'm not even asking those probing questions. What might the purpose of that been, have been? Another student says, to elicit responses. Another says, to invest children. She says, any other thoughts about why I might ask probing questions? To position students competently, checking for understanding, and then that conversation goes on. So very small snippet. This was like, you know, five seconds of time. <laughs> um, but I want to point out a few things that were happening in this moment. It's followed by a model of teaching, what Grossman would call a representation, right? So people are seeing teaching. Um, she decomposes that larger practice by identifying something specific. She could have said, what did you notice about how I got kids to the rug? What did you notice about the way I, I used students' names? Or she could have said, what did you notice about who I was calling on and why? But instead she says, what did you notice about eliciting and responding to students? A very specific part of what she was doing. She also includes a discussion of the instructional judgment, the rationale behind the visible action. So the visible action is eliciting students' ideas, then she wants to get people into the purpose, the reasons why she might have done those things. So the reason I'm putting this all up here is this is how, in practice-based teacher education programs, people teach about some things relating to discussion, for example. It is not how typically teacher education about uh, the work of centering social justice happens. I know this because I have been a teacher educator who's been primarily given the task of working on developing people as social justice educators. And usually I've thought about my task as being developing somebody's dispositions, developing their beliefs, convincing them that actually education should be oriented towards justice. Um, and I don't engage people in this kind of nitty gritty, fine grained work. So this led me to ask myself a question, which is what if these kinds of moments in teacher education were oriented towards social justice goals? If, if we're not doing that, what if the reason we're not seeing it in classrooms is that we're not teaching about it in practice-based ways? So what if we put in these empty spaces where all of the stuff about eliciting and responding was? What if we put in things like this? What if we gave models of teaching and then we said, what did you notice about my teaching in relationship to the way I decentered whiteness? What did you see me doing? Well, I saw that you, we, we always wanted to, we, we kept trying to talk about what the white people of the story might have felt and you kept bringing us back to the characters of color. Oh, well, why might I have done that? What might have the purpose of that been? Um, you can do the same thing with affirming students' cultural practices, acknowledging privilege, the list goes on and on. And this isn't just the only thing to do, but, but I have a wondering about this. Getting into the fine-grained work of teaching, are we preparing people to do the work in ways that they can take up? Um, uh, well, so one quick thing I want to say. We then, <laughs> there was a whole other part of the coding for this work that then happened. Most of the time, teacher educators were not using pedagogies of enactment, practice-based pedagogical approaches to teaching about the work of centering social justice, except one part of teaching. And I'm going to tell you how we figured that out. That we also applied a set of type of teaching practice codes. So um, we coded when anybody was working on planning versus when anybody, when a teacher was talking about their own planning or when a teacher educator was talking about the practice of planning, we coded it with a planning code. Planning codes were decisions that get made before children are present. When people were talking about decisions that get made while children are present, we gave it an instruction code. So examples of, um, this happens every time that wants me to get back on the internet. So um, anytime, these are some examples of planning things. Um, what book to read, this is a decision you make that's a planning decision. What book to read, what major questions to ask, what major tasks to include versus instructional decisions which happen when children are present. Uh, who to call on, how to follow up on a student's shared idea, when to speak, when to wait for children to speak. These are all decisions you make, but you can't make them in advance. You have to make them in the moment. So of those data excerpts that were coded with type of practice um, and centering social justice, so most data was not coded with a type of practice code. People aren't always working on practice. But when it was coded with a type of practice code, and when it was also coded with a centering social justice code, 
100% of the time, it was also coded as planning in the teacher education video. The teacher educators, whenever they did work on practice in relationship to social justice, it was always planning. It was never instructional decision making. It was never, this kid just shared this particular idea. What are you going to do next? Justice never came up in those moments. And then what was interesting is in the novice teacher's reflections, 90% was also coded as planning. So every once in a while it came in, but I guess that's not surprising. Given that 100% of the time when they were being prepared, justice got talked about as a planning problem and never as an instructional problem. So what I'm going to do with us now is I'm going to take us into this. So there's 10% here, right? There's 10% left. What was going on there? Because maybe it will give us some information that can be useful to us in thinking about how do we design experiences that get novice teachers to actually try on the work of centering social justice inside of their instructional practice. So I'm going to go into this 10%. It's not actually 10%, it's less than 2% because you remember not everything got a practice code. So it was less than 10% of the stuff that got a practice code, but of the entire corpus of data, less than 2% of the data was both centering social justice while making decisions during instruction. So we're going to go into that 2% of the novice teacher data and look at, well, what did that look like? Um, take you into this one teacher's classroom. I'm going to call her Sophia. Um, she is a Latinx woman. 60% of the participating, just as a note, 60% of the participating teachers in this whole study were teachers of color. She's in a rural K-5 school. Um, most of her students are also Latinx, um, and the majority of those students are emerging bilinguals. She is reading a book aloud to them and then facilitating a discussion. The book is called Harvesting Hope, um, the story of Cesar Chavez. And um, I'm going to just take you into uh, a moment where she is reflecting on her decision making, which got coded as during instruction, not planning. It got coded as centering social justice. So this is a very small part of our data. And let's just look at what does it look like when somebody uses concepts related to justice while they make instructional decisions. She says, one moment in the lesson where I think I did particularly well in eliciting and responding to students was when I asked students to reflect on what some white people who were not farm workers thought of Cesar and other farm workers. The question was attempting to get at the fact that the white people in the towns treated Cesar and others like him poorly because of their racial identity and their work. I had planned on asking the students how they thought this made Cesar feel after they addressed the first question. However, after the turn and talk, students immediately started answering how Cesar felt without me first asking the question. So here she is, she's facing a dilemma, right? Those of you who were with me earlier today, she's facing a pedagogical dilemma, which is she was gonna ask one question, but the kids skipped it and they went right to a question she was gonna ask later, what does she do now? So she's identified an instructional dilemma, the students have skipped to something she had planned to do later in the lesson. Then she says, instead of redirecting the students to the original question, I directed the conversation towards how Cesar felt, using connections to my students' feelings. For instance, I tried to tap into their background experiences by asking them how they would feel if they were told not to speak Spanish in the classroom. Additionally, because the students share many similarities with Chavez, it may have been unnecessary to go through how white people felt about farm workers to get to the content objective. Most of my students are surrounded with less overt forms of white prejudice and therefore need less processing time to get to the eventual objective of the question to infer how Cesar felt. So here, she does a whole set of things that she's talking about doing. She decenters whiteness. She attempts to build feelings of solidarity between her students and the students in the story. She honors students' choices about where they want to go. She acknowledges students' likely experiences with oppression. All of these things she's saying are influencing the decision that she makes in the moment. It's not a planning decision she makes. It's an instructional decision that she makes. Um, I'm just going to end with one of the final things she says because I thought it was so smart. She says, eliciting and responding to students in my classroom also meant knowing and accepting their background knowledge and experience is affecting the route to the content objective. So what's interesting to me about this particular excerpt is we don't typically, when we teach teachers, engage them in practicing, thinking about concepts related to oppression, privilege, um, identity, history in their in the moment instructional decision making in classrooms and if we did i'm wondering the wondering that i have is would this have been significantly more than two percent of our data would teachers have been calling on a set of principles that they have relating to justice and their knowledge of histories of oppression to tie into the decisions that they make in the classroom if we change the way that we taught about those things in teacher education coursework um so 
Um, what I saw this as, what's, when, and the reason this all matters to me right now is in the field, in teacher education right now, there's a debate going on about whether or not when you focus on practice, you peripheralize justice. This is, that's the title of a paper that recently came out with Thomas Phillips and some colleagues. And I would argue that people like Sophia here are speaking about justice in the language of practice and speaking about practice in the language of justice. And that if we could orient teacher education programs to support people to do that, we might be combating the mismatch problem that we see related to centering, centering social justice. How we teach matters. And how we teach about justice, I think, matters quite a bit if we care about what people go on and do in their classrooms with kids. Um, so I'm going to end with a couple of questions. So what does all this mean for teacher education and teacher education research? Uh, I would argue that social justice teaching is typically conceptualized these ways, as a set of beliefs, orientations, dispositions, awarenesses. We talk about whether someone's woke or not, right? That's like a dispositional thing to be. And it's atypically conceptualized as practice, as something that we actively do and can work on doing. Um, when it is conceptualized as practice, it's typically conceptualized as curricular planning. So whose knowledge is getting granted legitimacy, um, who's getting represented in the curriculum, and how do you do that in, in relationship to your planning, or it's conceptualized as relationship building, right? How do you get to know students and families and communities? We atypically, we, we less typically focus on in the moment instructional decision making and how we might call on our frameworks on our judgment about, um, about students and about knowledge about the history of oppression to make instructional decisions. And what this has meant, I think, is that visions of justice in practice, not just justice as a larger ideal, but what justice looks like inside of the practice of teaching has remained in a black box for us. And that's a problem, I think. Um, this is a, a framework for thinking about the practice of teaching that I've been working with for a little while. Um, if we identify the practice of teaching as the encountering of a pedagogical dilemma, which Magdalene Lambert talked about as a um, moment when you're, you have equally good alternatives that you could choose from and you have to pick one, which is almost every single moment in teaching, right? Who do I call on next? What do I do with the thing that kid just said? Those kids are talking in the corner. Do I you know, separate them or do I tell them to be quiet or do I just let them go for a second and see what happens next? Every single tiny moment in teaching is a dilemma and then you have to use your professional judgment to decide what to do. You have to make a decision and you enact the move, a move that inevitably leads to another dilemma, right? So I would argue that practice-based teacher education is teacher education that engages teachers in the scaffolded process of going through this, practicing making these decisions and using judgments, like scaffolding people through rehearsals, through models where you stop and you talk about what's being done and why it's being done, what are the reasoning for that? That's a work of practice-based teacher education. Those are pedagogies of an act. Um, and uh, the question I have is, what are the unintended consequences of not taking novices through this cycle in a scaffolded way about justice, where the, where the judgment that's being used here is this stuff, where the judgment you're calling on to make instructional decisions is knowledge about power and identity, knowledge about privileges, about biases, about oppression, about marginalization, about the histories of various groups, whether they're racial or sexual orientation or any other of these various groups that have been historically marginalized. I think there are real unintended consequences to not giving people scaffolded opportunities to call on knowledge about this as they make instructional decisions through rehearsals, through models of teaching, et cetera. So for me, well, even though in the field we've been asking this question, wait a minute, is practice-based teacher education the opposite of social justice teacher education? The bigger question for me is can we prepare social justice teacher educators without practice-based teacher education? And, and for me, the answer right now, I think, is no. <laughs> I don't think it's a question about whether practice and justice are on opposite ends of the spectrum. It's a question about how can we leverage the things that we've learned about how to design practice-focused pedagogical approaches to teacher education to serve social justice goals. Um, so with that, I will end and I will open it up for questions and for hopefully less of questions and more just a discussion as a whole group. So thanks. No, it's three different pieces, actually. Um, so, and, and some of them are more focused on justice and not. But, but um, there are a lot of people, I think, right now, not just these people, who have questions about whether designing uh, experiences to practice, 
um, is taking time away and important effort away from working on developing orientations, justice focused orientations towards the work of TJ. There's, lot, there's lots of other, a lot of other lots of stuff inside of that. For me, the interesting questions are about teacher ed pedagogy. There's other questions about sort of how teacher education gets funded and who's getting funded. And that's a whole other question to engage in because it's not the focus of my work. It's like, but I think about Dagmar's piece for this is mostly like, it's, it's not in his exact time. Yes. So he doesn't go practice on the production of Ohio. He goes to the time. Yes. Are the others in that? Well, I think this is a question for the field as a whole, right? How do we differentiate? And this is one of the things that those of us who are working today, earlier today, um, the big question for us is there are lots of different focus, fo people focusing on practice in different kinds of ways, but they all get lumped together. And what does it mean to focus on practice in a way that could allow you to focus on justice versus what does it mean to focus on practice in a way that would disallow you from being able to do it? I don't know that we have an answer to that question yet. Yeah. Have you talked to the teacher educators? Um, like, have you reflected back after you found? Yeah. After. Well, one found of them was a co-author. Oh, yes. cool. <laughs> I'm just wondering about like the reaction and what they might now try to do in their own practice. Yeah. So, um, I I tend to always write with people who were actually doing it. Um, and uh, so in this case, we did this analysis together um, of her practice and her colleagues' practice together. Um, and we, one of the reasons why I we even sampled this particular group of, of teacher educators is, is because they were very, they were doing something that's atypical, which is they were trying to teach a justice-focused course using practice-based approaches, right? So they had a teacher who was typically a foundations teacher. It was in a practice-based program. I thought, this is, if we're going to learn anything, this is the place we're going to learn it. And what we didn't expect to find was that while there was a lot of rehearsing teaching and a lot of modeling of teaching and representations of teaching, it, it never, it almost never got worked on around the social justice issues, which they actually, I don't think, noticed at the time. It like, wasn't until going back and paying attention to that in this kind of systematic way that they even began to realize it. Um, so it's been a fascinating experience. I did a really similar methodological study on my own practice that wasn't about social justice teaching, but about something else. And I had the same moment. Like, the, the very detailed coding of your own practice is a very humbling experience <laughs> but also like really illuminating so it's been a great it's been a great process have, they, a team. have, have your co-authors did they change anything or did, are they being more explicit in their teaching i'm just wondering like the implications for uh yeah so I may mean, i mean, look well the findings of this are really very recent right so this is now you know <clears throat> about to be out but not out yet um but what we've talked about a lot when we've talked about what's going to happen out of this has been really noticing inside of her, like we had a they had a set of language for talking about things you might identify i mean the big thing for me if i can go back oh this keeps doing happening um uh, let me find the right slide this slide right we we often don't name this stuff and so one of the reasons why it doesn't happen is we don't really have language to say this thing, try to do this thing. And I think we're really resistant to it for a lot of, I think, legitimate reasons, which is you don't want to give somebody a, a recipe for justice because there is no recipe, right? But there are lots of things that we know don't happen. Like, um, like the, because I focus on like queer supportive teaching, just mentioning that queer people exist would five times a year would have be five times more frequently than people mention that anyone who's not cis and straight exists in the world. Like I can name for you a set of things that will definitely improve teaching that if I got people to practice doing would probably set them on a different path. <laughs> but there's some danger in doing that too, and I understand that. So I think this is naming this kind of stuff is is a hurdle that we have to go through. Yeah. Yeah, I actually have a question about this slide because it, it feels to me like it's centering whiteness and trust and biases. Like it almost feels like a decomposition of the work of um, I was wondering, like, yeah, like it, it could become sort of like a checklist. Yeah. And so, you know, could you do this and also not have a social justice orientation? So then, how do you, like, I think it's important 
name, what it is the teacher saying that you have in our setting, so we adjust it. But how do you also connect that back to like the purposes and the, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like like that that issue you talked about, how do you overcome some of that stuff? What do you think? I mean, I don't have the answer to that question <laughs> at all. But I do think I mean I think this is danger. This is this is the interesting territory of our practice based teacher education generally, whether you're talking about justice or not. Because there are people who engage in uh, practicing practice in ways that are about, um, I'm going to name a practice for you. It is the right way to do it. And then you are going to do that thing with fidelity. Nope, that wasn't with fidelity. Try it again, right? That is not a way of practicing practice that adheres to this model of teaching practice. So for me, oh, that's not a <laughs> for me, practicing teaching requires practicing decision making. So if you're not encountering a dilemma, using your judgment, making a decision, and then enacting a move that's going to lead you to another dilemma, you're not practicing teaching. So what you're doing inside of this space is you're having to call on professional judgment and make decisions that are not right or wrong. But you're having to call on a set of principled things to make principled decisions. That's true whether you're working on justice or not. There are people who do stuff that, that some people call practice based teacher education who don't do that. If I were to say, I want everybody to practice um, wait time, no, that wasn't long enough, that was only four seconds, not five seconds, try it again. That would not follow this move, right? But if we we're going to practice, uh, an interactive read aloud where you have to listen to students, what students say, and then respond in ways that take up their ideas and get them to talk to one another, you have to make a lot of decisions inside of that space. And there's no one right way to do it, but you're using a set of principles to make decisions. So I think what I'm arguing for is not that we need to name acknowledging privilege as the practice and then get everyone to do it with fidelity, but that we need to create pedagogical routines in teacher education that engage people in having to make complex instructional decisions and draw on their knowledge about how privilege works in order to make those decisions. So that's, I mean, it's more complex pedagogical work, but it could be bastardized in ways that would be not good. And so there's danger in it. There's definitely danger in it. Yeah. Building off that question, your third research question was like, how did um, the teacher dedicated yeah. pieces get taken up by the anonymous teacher? Yes. And so you talked um, about uh, the 100% of teacher educators coming from planning and then 90% um, uh, that in the, the novice teacher make questions. Um, in thinking about uh, social justice and the, the, the parts and even the, the different areas that you've listed, were there, I'm thinking back to Grossman's article where you, she talks about rowing the kayak, and so were there pieces that were taken up more easily? Did, did you subcode the planning um, into different parts of, of social justice? So were there parts of the social justice orientation that novices um, grasped or used yeah. more frequently? And the uh, reverse is, I think, is a more interesting question, where there are parts that they didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I haven't, I can't answer this like with, yes, our data shows, because I haven't done that analysis. Um, however, my hunch, having spent a lot of time in the data, is that the answer to that question is that yes, representation, um, so representing people who have historically been invisibilized or marginalized by curricular materials and by sort of society at large, Got taken up a lot inside of planning because there and because it was decomposed by the teacher educators they read the windows and mirrors stuff um, they practiced making decisions about who your students are and then what stories you're going to read and why and then a lot of what people wrote about in their reflections and their instructional decision making was completely tied back to all of that work that had been done in teacher education um, one i think we have done work in that space um, about teaching a lot. So there, there are resources to draw on around representation and representing people from historically marginalized group and curricular materials. We have done work in that space, and I think we as teacher educators have more resources to draw from to, to do that work, um, and that might be why. But I actually think that's a really interesting question and an interesting analysis to do with the rest of it. So thanks for giving me that idea. <laughs> yeah. I don't know exactly know what the question is that I'm going to be asking. Sorry. <laughs> but well, I don't know what the answer is. Either, it's it's a no. rather personalistic thing. When I was beginning to teach, um, I, and it was uh, admittedly at the college level, but here at Stanford, I actually took a course in junior college education and taught at uh, one of the local schools. And I, I learned, I practiced becoming an educator uh, 
and I used the students to be uh, my source of practicing. And I kept that up through quite a number of years until I learned how to be uh, an independent practitioner within education. And I, I, I think that the, the, the goal uh, that you, I, I sense you're alluding to is like especially social justice, which is now a buzzword, um, uh, has to be internalized. I mean, the practice needs to go like in kind of like your daily practice. I, I, it, it's not only my practice um, as an educator, it's my, it's my practice in being alive. And I was just wondering, and I'm working on a project, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. I would dearly love you to, to give me some information as how do you accomplish this? <laughs> <laughs> if I had the answer to that question, I don't like then but I was really But I mean, so you're asking this question, I, in some level, your question is about the relationship between belief and action, right? Yeah. So like, if, and I actually think in relationship to preparing people to be social justice educators, we as a field, have tended to think that what we have to do is create people with the right orientations, dispositions, beliefs, awarenesses first, and then get them to try stuff out. <laughs> if you remember the story that I told about how I came to be somebody who studies this kind of stuff, it was actually that I had a very central core belief and identity relating to something that I really wanted to do, which is be a career supportive teacher, and I didn't know how to do it. So there are a couple of things I could say about that, which is one, maybe I just didn't need to do that other stuff. And, and now I was ready for the next step, which was about learning how to practice. Like I had already built the core belief and disposition. But I have a question about that, which is I wonder if actually people can develop dispositions and awarenesses through action. And then if we differently scaffolded the kind of action that we engage novice teachers in, we might be able to influence their dispositions and their awarenesses in a, in a reverse kind of way. It has to be simultaneous. Yeah. Because you don't want to, what you don't want to do is create some sort of checklist of justice, right? And get people to go off and do it. Because that's going to totally be against the point. Yeah. I just wondered if the, and I don't know the exact percentages today, but considering how the overwhelming majority of teachers are white and female, I just wondered how that impacted your thinking. Because I think the demographics of your, of your teachers were very different than the demographics of the state of teaching in America today. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a surprise that it was a Latina woman working with a Latinx community <laughs> who had a lot of the knowledge that she needed to be able to make those decisions. That was not an accident. Um, so there is stuff inside of that that I don't have the answers to because obviously the, it, it matters who we are. It matters who our kids are, it matters who we are in relationship to what we can know about each other, whether we share experiences and backgrounds um, and visions of the world based on those experiences. Um, however, I think but in part because so many white women are teachers and, and teaching uh, kids of color in poverty impacted communities, those are teachers who have not had the experiences that they need to know what to do. And supporting them and giving them scaffolded approaches to developing their practice and really thinking about histories of oppression as they make instructional decisions, I hope, would help them be able to take that step up more. But you know, it's an open question. I think we have to we have to really try some things out and we need to do more research and we need to figure out whether or not some of these hunches from this small study play out at any kind of larger scale. Yes. Thanks and fascinating. I have a kind of information technologies, social justice uh, spreading uh, abroad, and uh, even maybe with Guatemala um, and your learning experiences there. So you use a lot of very interesting information technologies, video coding that could be put into machine learning, and even something in something like Google 10 person group video hangouts. I'm curious um, whether you see a move in uh, among your colleagues um, for uh, researching social justice practices in that environment um, and um, even pedagogical um, teaching that goes on in there. And also, uh, if you were to brainstorming wise, imagine uh, doing these kinds of teaching of teachers of social justice in Guatemala in Google Group Video Hangouts. Um, in Spanish. <laughs> um, uh, 
Uh, so, you know, where would you go with this research uh, as sort of to complement this um, in very interesting talk you've given? Oh my God, there are so many yes, things inside of that question. Pick one, pick, <laughs> pick, pick a half. I mean, uh, I think that the development of technologies, specifically technologies relating to video, have made it much more possible to combat this mismatch problem stuff. Because before we could really easily get people to capture video and show video in teacher education classrooms, you know, by just finding it on the internet, rather than like having to have our own library of VHS videos that did everything we needed it to do, right? We weren't able to, sh the, the teaching you got to see was the teaching you saw when you went out into the schools or the like demonstration lesson that uh, your teacher educator gave you. And that was kind of it. So the development of some of this, some of the technological advances we've made have made a lot of this much more possible. Um, the other parts of your question are way too far above my pay grade to even begin to try to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, one, going back to the mismatch and yeah. thinking about the, the two worlds problem, um, are you including um, once they're out of it, so not just like their student uh, teaching experiences or uh, experiences that they have in the classroom while they're still part of their pre service education, um, they have that affiliation, but when they leave, um, how does the um, the messages that they may have received in their um, uh, teacher education program align with the norms or the culture of the school, which may also be um, more conservative in that they, they don't fully align. Are you, is that a third mismatch or are you including that partially under the mismatch of, of that in either in uh, can or not? I was including that in that, in that space. What's interesting though, there was a study um, that Pam Grossman and Sheila Valencia and somebody else did, um, that found that while teacher candidates, you're nodding your head like maybe you've read this one. Do you know who the third person was? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel bad not remembering. Um, but that found that when teacher candidates took on their first jobs, a lot of what they had learned in teacher education um, fell away in what they did in their first year on the job. However, it came back again, right? That, that actually people over time, as they sort of got their feet underneath them, started in their second and third year to bring back a lot of the things that they had touched on in teacher education. So that's not an answer to your question, but I just think it's an interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering if you can offer that, um, if there's, if you're aware of any work that's looking at this kind of social justice orientation and practice-based teaching in this existing service teacher. Hmm. I'm not, but maybe somebody else is. It, what's hard is that the, the language about practice-based teacher education and the like constructs around like representation, decomposition, approximation, and pedagogies of enactment, pedagogies of investigation tends to exist in a completely separate world than the research on social justice teaching, where there's lots of research. But the, the, two, the two frameworks rarely get brought together. And I think that's to the detriment of what we could learn. Um, so my hope is that there will be more of that over time. Um, my fear is I think right now in the field we're developed, there's starting to be the development of a belief that those two things are in opposition to one another. And I worry about that quite a bit because I, I don't think they're about the same thing. I think one is about how we teach in teacher education and the kinds of learning experiences that novice teachers have. And the other is about the goals, the ends for which we want, what we want people to be doing. So in some ways, and I said this to you earlier today and to others, right? Practice-based teacher education and a lot of this work on pedagogies of enactment and representation, decomposition, approximation is about drawing a map that makes it possible to get somewhere. A lot of the times, it's agnostic about where you're getting, which is a problem in practice-based teacher education. It doesn't mean, however, that the, all of the things that have been learned about that map should get thrown out the window, because it's really important, helpful work. Whereas a lot of other work around social justice teaching has been like the painting of a really beautiful destination with no information about how you would ever get there, right? Which is great. You want to know the destination. But we, the two things really need each other. We need to know where we're going, but we also need to know what kinds of productive steps we can take as novices to be able to get towards that place. Yes. You, Brad. Um, <laughs> I think it, it's speaking to the point of how siloed the education industry is, but can you imagine the types of collaborations um, that would really push this work forward and, and who would be some of the people uh, that might best to come together to push this forward because it seems so rich with potential yet so uh, far from reality. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I would say 
that that there I worry that it won't happen. I worry that it won't happen because I think animosities are getting built and sort of like walls are getting built and people are sort of getting into camps. And I think we'll be, instead of getting into camps, and this is a problem of academia generally, right? We make our careers off of critiquing one another. We don't make our careers typically off of building bridges from one set of scholarship to another set of scholarship. I actually think those are two really different ways of engaging in academic work. And I think it is, it is more easy to find people who are making careers off of critiquing one another than to find people who are making careers off of building bridges between two things that you didn't think went together. And I think that's what I want to see more of, right? I want to see more, and those of you who are doctoral students in the room, like, if you, if, you could, if you could say, like, what are two things that would benefit from one another but don't talk to one another? Like, build your career by building that bridge, by building the bridge between those two things. Because we can critique each other all we want, but we're not going to get smarter by tearing each other down. We're going to get smarter by building each other up and using what each other knows that don't get used together. 